Good morning, Wesley. How's everyone doing? Shall we rise for this time of worship? I'm going to read from um, Psalms 24 for us. It's a Psalm of David and it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to Him. For He laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies, they will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God their Saviour. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the King of glory. Shall we worship the King of glory in this place this morning?
It was my cross you bore So I could live In the freedom you died for And now my life is yours And I will sing
You're worthy to receive all honor, all glory, all power and dominion. Lord, we meditate. We meditate on the cross. We meditate on Calvary. We meditate on your wounds. We meditate on your suffering. Lord, we respond in gratefulness for all you have done. Lord, we're here this morning as your people called out of darkness into your marvelous light because you offered yourself for us. It is who you are, O oh Lord. It is who you are. You are love, you are grace, you are kindness, you are mercy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blood.
cross today as we remember the blood that was shed and the freedom that was won for us no matter how undeserved that was given to us unconditionally so as a people in possession of such freedom and such grace shall we proclaim with conviction that Jesus is our all in all there is nothing else
of it all. Receive, Lord, this offering of worship. You are worthy of it all. From your people. Lord, indeed, you deserve all honor and glory for the power of the cross. You have indeed won for us. For through the power of the cross, O oh Lord, we have not just been redeemed, but by your blood, we are continuing to be restored unto you. So grant us strength, O oh Lord, and the confidence to draw near to You. To know, Lord, that Your love pursues each and every day. And that You meet us indeed where we are. For indeed the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorching His shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, will not grow weary and lose heart. Hallelujah. Oh Lord, we thank you for the joy that has been set before you for our sake. The joy of our salvation for our sake the joy of which we meet each and every day despite the difficulties. For our sake, the joy that is set before you, for our sake, we thank you, we praise you, we exhort you. May our worship, O Lord, indeed be day and night and not just stop after this day. May our worship to you, O Lord, resound the glory of the cross that you have overcome. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You are our great overcomer and we look to you. And even today, O oh Lord, as we stand ready to receive of your word once again, O oh Lord, we want to pray for PIC. It's going to bring us your word, O oh Lord. Use it mightily as your vessel. Strengthen and refresh it and prepare your people, O Lord. Prepare your people, O Lord. Your truth. Your truth. Thank you. We praise you. We love you, O Lord. We declare as we come before you and commit ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen, Amen. Let us give on to the Lord for our praise and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We worship you. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Welcome once again to our 11 o'clock service. This is Blessed Friday, where we remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ as He took up Himself as our sacrifice upon the cross of Calvary. In some countries, um, actually, it's a trivia, uh, it is known as Long Friday. Do you know? Anyone know why Long Friday? I found it to be uh, very ministering as uh, Long Friday truly points us towards that endurance of Christ's suffering and pain on the cross. Much to ponder upon as uh, disciples of Christ as we follow after Him in this journey to the cross. 
And with that, we also want to welcome uh, into God's house with us guests today. If you're new with us, first time here in Wesley Methodist Church, we want to welcome you and uh, we've prepared something for you as well. So raise up your hand courageously, if I may. Hello. Thank you, brother. I see your hand. I appreciate you. Thank you for raising up your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, I don't want to miss you out. Just wave at me violently so that I can see you. Hello, brother. I see you. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Okay, from my left. Hello. Yes, I see you. Thank you. Welcome, sister. Welcome. Wow. Quite a few of us. Anyone here on my right? We are with friends, with family. Okay, if if you are shy, okay, we got one sister here. Yeah, with the pack. Thank you. Yeah. And so, um, for those of us who are shy, okay, do not worry. We still want to meet with you. Yeah. And so, together with those who have raised up your hands, uh, we want to invite you to our welcome corner out at the atrium. If you don't know where is it, just uh, go to our friendly hospitality team members who is going to show you where it is and we would love to connect uh, with you. Of course, those of us that are joining us on live stream as well, welcome to our 11.30 service and you are, if you are our guest, go to our website at wesleymc.org slash connect, uh, drop in your details, we would love to connect with you as well. And so, in that spirit, shall we welcome one another into the house of the Lord, shall we? Yeah, let us greet one another this blessed Friday. And let us share God's shallow peace with one another. And so, peace of the Lord be with you. Peace of the Lord be with you. So the Lord be with you. Thank you, worship team, for serving. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Shalom, shalom. Let us wave at PIC as he, as he walks around the hall. <laughs> and that is how you make knowledge. So I want to encourage all of you uh, and live stream. You know, we would love to meet with you in the flesh. So do join us as well. We would love to have you here worshipping with us. Yep. On that note, um, we want to... Uh, uh, I want to actually announce uh, just a couple of announcements. We do not have uh, Wesley Highlights uh, Friday. We do have it on Sunday itself. Um, and so two announcements. Uh, one, through this week, actually our church have uh, been experiencing, um, you know, Jesus' footsteps uh, to the cross, this journey to the cross event that we have. The event is officially over. However, we do have this booklet that you can pick up, okay, to join us as well in the experience, yeah? And so do pick it up from our hospitality team uh, member uh, if you have not, yeah, pick this up. The other announcement uh, is... What's the other announcement? <laughs> Easter Sunday, that's right. We'll see you uh, this Sunday for Easter as well. Do not, uh, uh, do not forget, yeah, as we come together to worship Him, our speaker, for Easter Sunday is uh, Bishop Dr. Gordon Wong. Yep, he's going to preach both at the uh, sanctuary and here at Wesley Hall. And so on that note, uh, we're going to give unto the Lord uh, our tithes and offering as part of our worship right now. And so allow me to pray on behalf of all of us. Let us pray. We thank you, O Lord, for this day, this blessed day, this day, O oh Lord, where you have shown us your goodness and your love. And as your people that have encountered your love and experienced your goodness, grant us, O oh Lord, a generous heart to give unto you your tithes and our offering as our worship. As our worship, O oh Lord, that we may learn and grow to bless, to be a blessing to all that is around us to be a blessing to those, O oh Lord, in which you have called us to minister to. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so this is the details to give. Of course, if you have been giving physically, uh, you may continue to do so by dropping them off at the offering boxes as you exit the premise. 
for those of us who uh, have issues with the QR code that is before you, uh, just keep your hands up. Uh, our hospitality team members will come to you with our official QR code. Yeah, just uh, keep your hands up yeah, if you need the uh, the Lord for our giving. May the Lord continue to bless it. And so as we give, uh, for some of us, we might be still trying to figure out, I see you. Yeah. Uh, and I want to encourage you uh, to continue to explore as well if you're having issues right now, the other means of giving. Thank you. Can I invite all of us to stand right now uh, and let us sing the doxology to give unto the Lord all glory. And praise. Together. Good afternoon, church. Good morning. That's a good Friday. It's a good to see all of you. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord on this Friday? I am, I am. And I, you know, I think God has a living word for each one of you who come. Because you're not here by chance. I believe that every time you make the effort to come into God's presence, to receive Him through worship, through prayer, God is going to speak to us through His Word. And you know, we are on a sermon series on the book of Mark. Last night at the Maundy Thursday service, Pastor Lydon preached on Mark chapter 14. I'm going to move on to Mark chapter 15. And on Sunday, Bishop's going to close with Mark chapter 16, the very last chapter. So we want to see Mark through all the way to the end. And it's my privilege to preach God's Word today for Mark chapter 15 on the crucifixion, the arrest and the death of Jesus. This is the scripture text for today. Now, as we read God's Word, I'm going to invite you to do what we call a spiritual reading, which means these are just not just words that I proclaim. These are words of life that God breathes to you. So allow the Spirit to breathe a word to you, a word in season, something that He may speak to you, a word that catches your attention. Is that all right? Let's look at God's Word today. Mark chapter 15. Give you the screen. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, it was a custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. And a man named Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionist who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. 
But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Verse 25. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. At noon, darkness over the whole land. There was darkness until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama lava sabni. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, reveal to us your word. What is the one word that comes to your mind as scripture is read? Just hold that word to your heart and ask God to breathe His life and meaning into those words for you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done on the cross. Speak to us now, for we are servants, we are listening. In Jesus' name, Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. You know, this is one of the all-time favourite, right? We have children amongst us, and this is a song that we learn from young. But what does it really mean to follow Jesus? Now, Good Friday reminds me that to follow Jesus is to go the way of the cross. And today, the cross is a religious symbol. You see the cross in front of a house, and you know it's a church, right? The cross has also become a fashion statement. You see tattoos of crosses on people because it tells of a story, it tells of a statement. But many actually have no idea of the origins of the cross. The cross was in fact a symbol of death. The cross was a political symbol before it became a religious symbol. The cross was the ultimate symbol of the Roman power in the time of the Roman Empire. Did you know that the Romans had crucified thousands of rebel Jews when Jesus was just a little boy in Galilee? And they were crucified thousands more when they took Jerusalem in AD 70. And so crosses were the reality on which the Roman Empire was built on because it was a symbol of fear, a symbol of power. In fact, polite Romans don't talk about crucifixion and the cross among themselves because it's like a swear word in those days because the reality of the cross was so ugly, so brutal, so repellent. But as Christians, if you say, I have decided to follow Jesus, then may I suggest that you choose to follow the way of the cross. And from the scripture text in Mark 15, I want to draw three lessons for us. First and foremost, my friends, the cross reveals the redefined justice of God. The cross expresses the radical love of God. And the cross compels a reverent confession to God. And so justice, let me begin with that. The redefined justice of God. The starting point is in Mark 15. Look at Mark 15. There is a lot of apparent, apparent injustice. I see that in the trial process. Because before Jesus got to the cross, he had to stand trial before Pilate. Number one, injustice, there was political manipulation. There was political manipulation through the charge. What was the crime that Jesus committed that caused him to appear before Pilate? You see, for Jesus to be crucified, he had to be declared guilty under Roman law. Now what Jesus was initially accused of was a violation of Jewish religious law. 
That's the religious charge of blasphemy for him declaring himself to be a Messiah. If you look at chapter 14, they were accusing him of that. And even the testimony was inconsistent in chapter 14. And so the religious leaders decided, if we're going to bring Jesus to Pilate, we need to frame a charge that is of the highest order. And so they frame a charge as the king of the Jews. Now when you frame a charge like that, that means it's a crime now against the king of Rome the sovereign power of Rome. And so through intentional political manipulation, this would justify sending Jesus to Pilate with the insinuation that Jesus was a threat to the political order. You must understand that the Romans did not interfere in local Jewish politics. They don't. But when you bring it before them of the highest court and order, they will have to take action. So guess what, my friends? Jesus was helpless. He was helpless against a high-level political manipulation by the authorities in ensuring that he would face the worst judgment of the highest political order. Number two, second injustice. Not just the charge, but the judge. The self-serving indifference of Pilate. You see, as governor, Pilate had the power to adjudicate the trial. And historians like Josephus and Philo have told us that governors, Roman governors, have sometimes taken advantage of their powers. In fact, Pilate was known to be very cruel. He was known to arbitrarily use his power. But truth in, in Jesus' case, Pilate didn't care. He was indifferent to the truth. His aim was simply to prevent a riot. He had no obligation or desire to hold a fair trial. His aims were self-serving. He simply wanted to satisfy the crowd and take the easy way out. And so he gave in to the wishes of the Jewish leaders and the crowd that they stirred. Despite the innocence of Jesus, which he knew, Pilate found him guilty and ordered him to be crucified. Thirdly, the third injustice, the fickle abandonment by the crowd. Come on, Jesus, it's not fair. It's not really not fair to you. You did so much good. You healed the sick. You fed the hungry. You set the demon possessed free. You taught so much about scriptures. And yet the people who cried Hosanna a few days ago will now say crucify him. What a fickle crowd. Last Sunday, Pastor Chinam was preaching here. He said the crowd went from cheers to jeers. It's just not right for Jesus to be so loved at one instance and then to be so reviled at the next. Where is the justice? It's not fair. Today you can identify with Jesus. You can identify with the injustice. Perhaps some of you have experienced a manipulation at the highest level that got you backstabbed and then thrown by the wayside. Perhaps some of you have experienced a backroom manoeuvre that brought your reputation down. Perhaps you have experienced an indifferent boss who didn't care less about the truth. When you needed the boss to be there for you, he threw you under the bus. Perhaps you experienced a time where you have done so much for the family, done so much for the ministry, done so much for the company, and then you are just left aside, unappreciated and abandoned. Perhaps some of you have been betrayed in a friendship and even in a relationship, and you feel forsaken. Perhaps it's an injustice that you feel for a friend. You say it's not fair. God, he's a good man. Why is this happening to him? You say, it's not fair. She has done so much. Why is she being so sick? God, it's not fair. Haven't you cried that? My friends, what Jesus went through made no sense. But God redefined justice through the way of the cross. That's how he did it from Scripture. Firstly, in God's redefined justice, you trust him to vindicate. You trust him to vindicate you. Because Jesus was silent. Look at Scripture. Jesus was silent. Now, Pilate expected him to answer to the charge. That's what any ordinary person to do. Because in law, you know, an adverse inference can be drawn against you if you remain silent. Of guilt. And Jesus, in remaining quiet, would point to the fact that he was guilty. But you see, Jesus refused to defend himself or implicate his fellow Jews. He could have done that. He could have exposed the schemes of the religious leaders. But his silence amazed Pilate. And we are reminded of Isaiah 53, where the servant gives his life as a ransom for many. The servant is like, led like a lamb to the slaughter. He does not open his mouth. And if Jesus is the Messiah, then for Mark, Jesus is the silent servant king. 
the silent servant king. Because Jesus saw no need to justify himself. Because Jesus trusted in the ultimate purposes of God. He left it to his heavenly father to provide an answer to the charges. To be honest, my friends, it would have seemed that the chief priests have won the day, that Pilate's indifference got the way. Jesus might have faced gross injustice, but my God, our God, has the last and final say. Amen? The wicked and unjust may think they have won today for you. And you feel the injustice, but I want to let you know that they will not win, not on the other side of eternity, because God remains in control and He's, He's the one that will vindicate you. Number two, God's redefined justice invites us to redeem instead of retaliate. The crowd mocked Jesus. They say, if you are the Messiah, come down now. Come down now and save yourself. Come on, my friends. Jesus could have easily done that. He had at his disposal armies of angels that could come and destroy the entire Roman Empire and deal with everyone who, who caused him harm. You see, that would have been the right thing to do. That would have been the just thing to do because we take for granted what Scripture always tells us how Jesus died on the cross, but we forget the power that Jesus had that He did not exercise. Instead, what did Jesus, did Jesus do? He soaked up all the injustice, all the evil, all the oppression, and then He unleashes a more powerful and a greater force. Love and forgiveness. Because on the cross as He hung, He said, Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus, you got it wrong. They knew exactly what they were doing. But Jesus forgave because they did not know that they were part of God's larger divine plan for salvation. And in suffering injustice, Jesus brought about redemptive justice. Redemptive justice. In dying on the cross, He allowed the satisfaction of God's righteousness and the expression of God's love. You see, because God is perfectly just, we will actually have to pay the price for our rebellion. Think about it. And we want God to be just, right? We want a God who is just. But if God who is indeed just, then guess what? You and I have to pay the price of our rebellion. That's justice. But God is not only just, He's also loving. And His love led Him to make the choice to take our punishment and place it on His Son. Come on, guys. That's actually not very fair to God. But at the cross, God judged our sin as His righteousness requires and saves us as His love desires. This blew my mind when the Bible commentator expressed this so powerfully, so succinctly. This is the redemptive justice of the cross. And Barabbas received this justice. Come on, friends. Who was Barabbas? A Jewish rebel, a real Jewish rebel. He was a murderer, determined to use violence to defeat the Roman Empire. But God's redemptive justice would have Jesus, the innocent one, take his place. My friends, can I say, at the heart of it, there is a Barabbas in each of us. There is a Barabbas in each of us. Because we want to do things our way. We rebel. We will do whatever it takes to get whatever we want. We will trample on others, we will manipulate, we will hurt others. And when we are caught in the shame of our guilt and our failure, Jesus comes and takes our place. Guilty men set free and innocent men crucified. That's not fair, God. But that's God's redemptive justice. Truly a gift of God's grace. Can I hear amen to that? Amen. Amen. Thank you, children, for that. Lovely, lovely. We should have more children here to do the amens. God's redefined justice is also to surrender. But this is the hardest part for me. Surrender to God's outcomes. Because you know what? We want justice now, if not yesterday. We want it done our way. We want to see outcomes according to what we want, what we desire. But do you know that the way of the cross is to trust in God's perfect time and sovereign outcome? The cross, my friends, is a promise that ultimately justice will prevail. How do I know that? Because it starts with the cross. Jesus has to die. That's why we say Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will Thank you. Christ will come again. There is a pattern of salvation. It takes the first step for Christ to die, that He may rise, and then He will come again. And when He comes again, you can be sure 
the justice will be fully accomplished. That's why he says, hey guys, trust the way of the cross. Friday is here, but Sunday is coming. Turn to your neighbor and say, Sunday is coming. So see you at church. <laughs> no, my friends, theologically, Sunday is coming is a reminder that the resurrection is just around the corner. And for some of you, you are going through the season where you are wrestling with the cross, but do you know that the resurrection life will come? And beyond that is the hope that one day when Christ returns, all will be made right. Amen? I don't know about you, but that's my hope. And so this Good Friday, would you follow Jesus to obey this fundamental discipleship call? Would you embrace and apply God's redefined justice in your life? Now, let me say, this doesn't mean that Christians are doormats to be trampled upon. I don't mean that. It does mean that there are times when we will choose to be quiet and silent because we will trust in God to vindicate. There are times where even though we may have the answer, but there is a surrender to the outcome and the timing of God for His justice to be done in His way. It also means that we will choose to wait on God for that strength to forgive. And in our forgiveness, in our letting go, we actually unleash God's redemptive purposes to restore, to heal, to bring about such divine healing to brokenness in our lives. It also means, my friends, whenever you turn to the newspaper or check CNA every day and you wrestle with the injustice that happens, you say, God, I turn to the way of the cross. I trust that in your time, you're going to make all things right. So my friends, hear the discipleship call today. And when you struggle to apply this redefined justice of God, that's where you turn to the radical love of God. That's my second point. That's the way of the cross. How many of you are wearing crosses right now? Just a show of hands. Anyone? Some of you are wearing crosses. You know, a little girl told the mom, Mom, mommy, mommy, I want to see you wear the cross. So the mom asked, you know, why? Why do I have to wear the cross? The mom replied, uh, the girl replied, Oh, mommy, you must wear it because the people in the world must know that Jesus loves them. The Bible tells me so, right? Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Do you know that the cross tells me so that I am radically loved by my God? Now you must understand that there were tens of thousands of other crosses in Jesus' time. Just in case you think that that was the only cross. That's not the only cross. There were many other people who were crucified. But what made this cross so unique was that the Son of God Himself should come and then die on the cross. And what's also radical about this love is what Jesus willingly went through in His death and through His death. Now I must tell you that Mark is really very raw in the way he describes the crucifixion. He doesn't make any mention of blood or nails. It simply says, they crucified him. But make no mistake about what that means. The reader during Mark's time would know exactly what Jesus went through because at the centre of the crucifixion is something deeply violent, offensive and degrading. Crucifixion was the Roman way of saying, if you dare mess with us, there is no limit on what we will do to you. And so crucifixion aims to dehumanize you. First, they will physically torment you. And they will begin with the scourging or the flogging or it's known as a weeping. Now guys, imagine with me for a while. Your foot is bare and you step on shattered glass. Painful. And then you start to pull every piece out. And every, and every piece is pulled out. Imagine the pain. Now imagine after you put every piece out, you step on the glass again. And then you pull out the pieces again. And the third time you step again. Which one of you would want to do that? Or want to go through that? Can I say that what the Romans did was to use a very unique kind of whip. It's, it's a leather tongs plated with pieces of bone, lead and bronze. You can see on the picture, the pieces right at the end, sharp pieces with spikes. And when they lash you, your bare back, every force of the whip has the metal dig into your flesh and rip it out. And it will go again and again and again. And every time your flesh is ripped, the ripping gets deeper 
and the pain is intolerable. After that, they hang you. They hang you by nailing you to the cross. Now, many of us imagine the pain that goes through our wrists, and that's very painful. But that's not the end of it. Imagine your weight hanging on three nails. Your entire weight hung on three nails. That's what the Romans do. They make you suffocate to death slowly. So every breath that you take is pain. Jesus hung on the cross for six hours and every breath was a laboured pain. You know the English word excruciating? It's very seldom used these days, but excruciating means very painful. The word excruciating comes from a Latin word excruciatus, which has the root word excruciare. Ex means out of, cruciare means torture and torment. So the word excruciating has its roots in the idea of pain that comes from the torment of the cross. That's not the end of it, my friends. Jesus didn't just go through pain. He went through utter humiliation. Because apart from the jeering and the taunting, those crucified were hung naked. Now, you don't see in the pictures and the paintings about Jesus because the painters preserved the modesty. But the Romans didn't care about that. They crucify you naked. They have every opportunity to thoroughly humiliate you. They will do that and victims were hung at the most visible places, in the most traveled roads, where your family, your relatives, your friends, your villagers will see you. And guess what? They will disassociate from you. They will walk past you. They will not even look at you because you are a Roman criminal. To die on the cross is to be abandoned to die in the worst and the most painful way possible. I always wonder why, Jesus, you have to go the way of the cross for me. I always wonder, Jesus, why couldn't you just have saved us in a more safe and a more sane way? You could have activated your fingers in heaven and say, I love them so much. Save them, God, and they are, we can be saved. Why do you have to come down and die like a criminal? Why? At this station, a journey to the cross, those of you who came the past few days, I cried my heart out, right? At this station, because right here, when the video of the crucifixion was played, and as my senses were engaged in what Jesus went through, my eyes were just welling up in tears. I realized the radical love that my Lord has shown me. See, my friends, this love is not the sentimental and fluffy love that you see sometimes in Korean drama. This love is tough. This love is resilient. This love saw Jesus go to the cross and stayed on the cross. You see, Jesus could have come down. The crowd were jeering him. You are the Messiah. You come down. And here's the paradox. See, if Jesus had come down from the cross, he would not have been the Christ. He could only be the Christ by staying on the cross. Jesus didn't save himself. For in saving himself, he would have lost us. It's only by losing himself then can he really be God and save us. So my friends, this Good Friday, I do not know what you're going through in your life, but I want you to know that through the excruciating pain and the suffering of crucifixion, Jesus I knows what you go through. He identifies exactly what you go through, whether it be pain or humiliation or anxiety or your struggles, remember that our Lord stayed on the cross for you, amen? Henry Nouwen writes, where God's absence was most loudly expressed, God's presence was most profoundly revealed. Why? Because of the cross. Because of the cross. When you think that God, you are most absent in my valley, then can I know that you will you know that God's presence is right there with you? Because of the cross, we know that God will never leave or abandon us in our greatest time of suffering because He did not leave the cross. He did not leave the cross. And what comfort and strength it brings us. Amen. 
Let me share you two stories, quick one. Alpha Conference last year, this is a powerful testimony of a North Korean woman. She was caught while trying to escape North Korea, so they threw her in prison. And being Christian, she started a church in the prison. Guess where she held her services? The toilet. She would wait in the toilet and two or three ladies would come one and one time, or two or three are gathered in your, my name, right? Really? Just two or three. They would gather around the sick. She would recite a verse. She would sing a song and that's their church service. And that kept them going on in a North Korean prison. They caught her for her faith and they tortured her. And she shared her story in tears. She said they electrocuted her. And in the pain of pain, there was a vision of God's light. She saw Jesus coming to her and to her, it was a comforting thought that her Lord had gone through the cross and her Lord is right there with her. The next story is a testimony of a church member. Recently, I met him and he's, he just went through a major surgical operation. And so his non-Christian friends were asking him, why doesn't your God take away your pain? He answered, in this world, there will always be pain but I have peace in the pain. I have peace despite the pain. And this peace is from my God. But he then turned to me and said, you know, Pastor Ray, it's really very painful. It's really a lot of pain. And my heart just broke. My heart just broke. Because we all need the radical love of God to know that God does not leave us in times of horrible pain. And so this is the discipleship call. Would you receive this radical love of God this Good Friday so that you may sacrificially love someone? You may sacrificially love. On your own, you will not be able to. But when you look at the cross and what Christ has done, that love will transform you. That love will set you free. That love will empower you to sacrificially give of yourself for your family in ways that you cannot even imagine. You need that love, my friends. Now today you can reject that love. You can reject the love by saying, I don't need this love, God. I can do it on my own. You can reject this love by saying, God, I, will, I don't want to be indebted to you. You can reject this love by saying, God, I'm not good enough to be loved by you. But whether you know it or not, my friends, you are already loved. You are already loved. Receive that love so that you may go out to truly make a difference wherever God has caught you. And you can only radically love when you come to a fresh revelation. This is my final point, a reverent confession. You notice at the closing scene of the crucifixion, it was not a religious priest, not a pastor, not a teacher of the law, not even a disciple, but it's a battle-hardened Roman centurion who made a reverent confession. He was the one who said, surely this is the Son of God. Now my friends, you must understand that Roman centurions are used to crucifying people. Roman centurions are used to killing human beings with no qualms. That was part of their job. But something happened for this Roman centurion that day. He didn't say, surely this is the King of the Jews. That was the political charge. He cried, surely this is the Son of God. In the darkest day of human history, the love of God shined forth in Christ's sacrifice and the Roman centurion caught that. As a centurion, his allegiance is to the emperor. Now for the Romans, the emperor is the son of God. Because the emperor had all the majesty and all the military power, how everything had defined what a god should be, the Roman emperor had. And so rightfully, he is the son of God. But my friends, for the Roman centurion, this son of God died on the cross. The very exact opposite of what should define being a God. Where one would expect splendor, glory and might, there was none of it. Instead, my friends, a display of sacrificial love, self-giving love, of Jesus' obedience on the cross led to a heartfelt reverent confession by the Roman centurion. What's your confession today? May God help you to say, surely you are the Son of God. 
the Son of God who died for me. Surely you are the Son of God who paid the price for me. Question today, my friends, if He is the Son of God, is He your God? Is He your God? Will you allow this God to have His way with you? Because the proof is in the cross. Today, would you hear the discipleship call? And you confess, Jesus, you are my Lord. Lord, have your way. Have your way in me. Have your way with me. Would you take the way of the cross, my friends? Would you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I choose to walk in your ways because I trust in your redefined justice. I will not strive. I will learn to allow you to vindicate. I will wait upon you for your outcomes. I will trust that one day everything will be made right. Lord, fill me with your radical love that I may go forth to love. Give me grace to confess that you are truly my God as I give my life to you this day. And that's a beautiful song that expresses what God has done. It's a familiar one. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make me a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Would you sing with me? Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has I know that it is finished. Come on, church, let's declare. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. But this I know. But this I know with all my... Thank you, Jesus. Have made my ransom. Come, let's pray. Surely you are the Son of God. Surely you are the Son of God who died for me. Thank you, Lord, for taking the way of the cross. Lord, I receive your amazing love today. Lord, I pray you change me with this love that I may love and forgive that may love and serve others as you did Jesus. And my friends, today, if you have never received Jesus into your heart, into your life, maybe for you, you have always grown up in the church, but you never knew what it means to go the way of the cross. Today, you can open your heart. Today, you can open your heart to receive Jesus, not just as your Savior, but as your Lord. 
you can just simply say to God, you can say after me, God, I confess my sins. I need you. Forgive me. I receive your love. I receive what you have done on the cross for me. Come into my life. I want to know you more. You can receive Jesus into your heart today. As you God, today we confess that you truly are our Lord. Today, if we are going through the valley, we are going through a situation of injustice, give us grace to surrender to you and say, Lord, have your way. Do it in your time. Help me turn my eyes to the cross where justice has been redefined. Help me redeem and not just retaliate. God, give me grace to love sacrificially as I am loved by you. And God, give me grace to confess that you are my God and you can have your way with me because the cross is such proof of an amazing love that my God, my God should die for me. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done. We praise you. We worship you. We give our hearts to you this day anew. Hallelujah. Receive our worship. Receive our surrender. And give us grace to obey your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord and declare, Jesus, you paid it all. You've done everything on the cross for me.
Come on, church, declare this. The one who loves you and hates the death. Raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my death. Raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my death. Raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my death. amazing so divine that demands my soul my life my all Jesus you paid it all Jesus by your stripes we are healed by your wounds we are made whole and today Lord we will choose to rest in the amazing love of our Lord who went the way of the cross and give us grace to walk this way as well and as we do that Lord we will receive the ever sufficient grace and the strength to be your faithful disciple so thank you Lord and now may you be blessed by the goodness of this Friday. And as you receive His love, go forth now to love and to serve. And as you encounter His goodness, go in peace. It's Friday, but Sunday is coming. And the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And God's people declare, Amen, Amen. Come, let's give God a, a glorious clap in the house. Praise Him, praise Him. A most blessed Good Friday. Altar ministry is open. I want to invite you, if you have someone, you want someone to pray with you, don't rush to, uh, to lunch. Take time to come to the cross. You may sit where you are for a time of prayer. You may pray with your family or someone you, you came with, a friend. Just take some time to come to the cross. If you need someone to pray with you, altar ministers are right over here. The minister, God's grace and peace to you. Take care, everybody. See you on Sunday. Take care, everybody. God bless.